This is a production of Cornell University. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, so my name is Zachary Stansel, and I am the current USDA hemp germplasm curator. Um, and we are absolutely thrilled that y'all made a little bit of time today. It's going to be special and uh, you, you, it'll be well worth it. So I wanted to just quickly tell you a little bit about our work and why we were so excited to host Hemp 411. So my team and I run the Hemp Germplasm Repository in beautiful, cold, snowy Geneva, New York. Um, which is similar to a seed uh, library, but it's a library for seeds, which is really fun. So the first goal of this work is to protect the genetic diversity of many different kinds of hemp from all over the world. Um, our second goal is to make these seeds available for science. So these seeds, kind of like a library, can be requested by plant scientists, plant breeders, educators, um, we believe that these seeds hold answers to uh, all kinds of different questions that we would care about while studying them. Um, and we hope that our work here will allow universities, companies, farmers, and ultimately everyone to benefit from the thousands of potential uses of hemp. So during the course of this work, we've met all kinds of interesting dynamic people from across the entire world of hemp, and we wanted to share them with you. So we teamed up with some of our good friends at Cornell University to present them with you today. So um, I, I wanna first of all, thank Tony Baracco, who's working on my team, and he's done so much of, of the work for this, as well as uh, George Stack, Gemma Osborne, and Kim Paul at Cornell, who have been just awesome setting up all the logistics. Uh, but most of all, I am absolutely thrilled to present our speaker today. So her name is Dr. Heather Grab, and she is a senior lecturer in the School of Integrated Plant Science at Cornell University. So Heather delivers um, best practices for the cultivation and processing of cannabis and hemp to professionals in Cornell's hemp science program. She uses things like remote sensing, large scale community data sets, and advanced analytical methods to create data-driven solutions for challenges at the interface of natural resource conservation and agriculture. Um, a few things about Heather's work with hemp. She is on the European Industrial Hemp Fiber Working Group. Um, she is on the Education Committee for the Global Hemp Association, and she's a member of the Sustainability Committee for the New York State Growers and Processors Association. Um, also, in conjunction with all of that, Heather is widely known as an absolutely outstanding teacher and mentor for the Cornell Hemp MPS program. So I'm going to stop yapping, and I bring you Heather Grab. Thank you, Zach, for that kind introduction. Uh, thanks also to Tony and George and Gemma and others who've been involved in organizing this seminar series. It's a particular pleasure to be here to speak with this group from all over the world. And I'm really excited also for the participation of our colleagues from the 1890 land grant institutions within the US. Um, a special shout out also to the ASL interpreters that are on the call today and um, providing signing. I think I will probably give them a big challenge. So you'll notice many difficult words to begin with on my slide here. If you've tuned in to some of the other sessions that have already launched, you'll know that there are three broad market classes for hemp, and we will touch on the processing that's involved in each of those different market classes today. So before we dive in on that, I want to give you just a bit of background information about myself. So as 
Uh, Zach mentioned, I'm a senior lecturer in hemp science in the School of Integrative Plant Science here at Cornell University, where I teach courses and mentor students in our hemp science MPS program. So this is a graduate degree program. It's one year after students have finished their bachelor's degree that helps to develop a workforce that's ready to engage with this rapidly growing hemp industry. Before my role um, within the hemp science MPS program, I completed my PhD in entomology. So my academic background is really in crop protection and particularly in the integrated pest and pollinator management of crop systems. And I was lucky enough to work with some students here in our hemp program to catalog the diversity of uh, some insects you might not expect to see visiting hemp crops like these native pollinators. So to give you an idea more broadly of this program, it is a one year um, in class intensive master's degree program. Uh, one of your organizers, Tony Baracco, is an alumnus of our program. And I'm so excited that he still is close to us here at Cornell at uh, the Hemp Germplasm Collection, working with Dr. Zach Stansel. So some of the courses that we offer from this program that are really tailored towards hemp and cannabis production include the Cannabis Biology Society Industry Overview course that gives you an idea for market trends, regulations, business structures within the industry. I teach a class called Hemp Production Systems in the fall semesters. And then in the spring semester, students take courses focused on breeding and genetics, as well as the chemistry and pharmacology of cannabis and then take another class with me that has a really fun lab called hemp processing. And that is sort of what I'm gonna give you a sneak peek on in the slides today. So I've attempted to cover a semester's worth of content in just one 35 to 40 minute period here. So we're not gonna to go too deep on any one practice, but really just give you an overview of ideas in the industry. And again, as I mentioned earlier, my academic background is really as an ecologist and as a data scientist. So I'm not a chemist and I'm not an engineer, which hopefully means that we won't get too tangled up in the particular terminologies or processing efficiency equations that are really important to the industry. But the goal today is just to give you a broad overview. And I think one of the most important points to think about when we are approaching processing is how important it is overall for the industry. So I have taken just a, a brief snapshot here example for New York State, where Cornell University is located. This data is um, supplied by the New York State Department of Ag and Markets, which handles hemp production in New York State. And um, it's from our 2020 growing season. And in this season, we had about 25,000 acres of a licensed hemp. Not all of those acres were actually planted or harvested, but that was the amount that was licensed. Among 537 licensed growers with about 99 licensed processors. And so using those numbers, we can start to create a picture of what the ratio of growers to processors looks like in New York State. And the same equation with some numbers varying is also true for many other states across the US and countries across the world. So if we look at these numbers, what they tell us is again, making some assumptions around what was planted and how much in New York State where most of our acres are dedicated to high cannabinoid hemp. So I've made an assumption there. We have about 28 growers for every one processor. So if we spread those, those acres evenly among growers, that means each grower has around 50 acres of hemp that's licensed to them. And given the ratio of growers to processors, that means we have about 250 acres of hemp production for every licensed processor. Using data that was just released in the new USDA National Hemp Report, we now know that average production of floral hemp in open cultivation was around 1,235 pounds per acre. 
meaning that every one of those hemp processors, assuming that average rate of production across all of the acres that they would be responsible for divided equally, has about 300,000 pounds of flour to process. So focusing on the processing capacity of our cannabinoid hemp processors, if we take, for example, a craft processor, so really small scale production using a supercritical CO2 extraction equipment with 20 liter capacity can probably process around 40 pounds per day. That means it's gonna take them almost 21 years to get through that one year supply of hemp grown in New York state. And a little bit larger facility with a hundred liter supercritical CO2 extractor would still take about 4.2 years to get through their processing supply of cannabinoid hemp. And even the ethanol extractors, which have much larger capacity, so something close to 700 pounds per day, would still take over a year to process a single year's production within New York State. And what this highlights really is that the producers, and hopefully you, you know, tuned in to hear the earlier talks on indoor and outdoor fiber hemp and grain hemp and high cannabinoid hemp production, they've scaled up really rapidly, but we have not seen the same scale and capacity of our processors. So meeting that demand is really critical in developing the hemp industry, whether it's for cannabinoids, fiber, or for grain production within the US. So again, hopefully you are very familiar with these different market classes of hemp, but there's a few that we will touch on today, fiber hemp, as well as hemp that is grown for seed and grain, and then also spend some time talking about high cannabinoid hemp for flower production, as well as some of the processes that extract compounds that are relevant from the flower material. And I just wanna start off today because there will be many terms that are unfamiliar to folks with this brief warning, perhaps also for our ASL interpreters, that there's gonna be some technical terms still, and those will be heavier on the fiber processing side of things, but I don't want you to get scared and panic or tune out. We'll go slowly through each of these terms and spend some time talking about the anatomical parts of hemp. And then I encourage you, of course, to put your questions for the end in the Q&A. So let's start out with focusing on fiber processing. To understand fiber processing, you have to understand the anatomy of hemp. So what you can see here is an image of a cross section of a fiber hemp stem. And then we can also see sort of an illustrated image that will help us to better understand the key important parts. If we work our way from the outside in, we have the epidermal layer, that's that green portion on the outside of the stem. And just inside of that, we start to hit some of the most important parts of the stem, those primary bast fiber bundles. These are the portions that are most useful for textile production. Just interior to that, we have some smaller fiber bundles in the plant that are called secondary bast fiber bundles. So these, you'll notice they're smaller. They tend also not to be quite as strong and not as long. So they have different uses and applications. And as a uh, fiber hemp plant matures, we see a higher proportion of those secondary bast fibers compared to the primary bast fiber bundles. Inside of that, we probably have our next most important hemp fiber product. That is called the herd. It's that inner woody, woody core of the plant that we see a lot of development in the cannabinoid hemp fibers and also with grain hemp cultivars that need to hold up heavy inflorescences or inflorescences that are full of grain. But uh, we see somewhat less of these in cultivars that have been bred strongly for textile grade fiber production. So there, they would actually have much more of this hollow inner space inside the stem of the plant. And I mentioned each one of these products has a different set of uses. So those primary bass fiber bundles on the outside of the plant, 
produce that nice spinning textile grade fiber. The secondary bass fibers tend to produce shorter fibers called toe, which we might use for some non-woven applications. And then there's a lot of interest in products being developed from the herd, or also you will see it referred to as shives as well. So this slide here shows you an overview of the process diagram for taking hemp from harvest. So if you heard our very first talk in the series that covered many of the aspects that you would need to think about for fiber hemp production, and we're gonna pick up right where that left off and think about what happens after that crop is harvested off the field. How do we turn it into more high value products that are ready to go into different products that we might want to buy? And the very first step for fiber processing is something that's called redding. So redding is a step that involves either the microbial or the chemical breakdown of compounds called pectin, which are sticky gummy compounds that hold together all of those vast fiber bundles and keep them in contact with that inner woody core called the herd. So we wanna be able to separate those really cleanly, like in this diagram here from the plant. And so breaking down the pectins allows us to easily remove those vast fiber bundles from the inner woody core. And there's two different ways that this process is normally achieved. So field redding is one option, and we'll talk about that in a second, but there's also water redding as an option for breaking down that pectin material. So this is um, some illustrations from some scientific publications showing the, in the first panel here, the microbial community that was associated with the redding of fiber hemp. And that includes bacteria as well as fungi. And what this study reported was actually a very large proportion belong, of this community belonged to the proteobacteria which is pretty stable across the different stages of redding here, where each bar represents an individual stage. But we do see some groups that increase in their relative abundance across redding, like the bacterioides. So what are these microbes doing to the plant? That's where this other image comes into play here. So we have the inner woody core oops, represented here. And then the outside of the stem is labeled over here, that's the epidermis. And sandwiched in between these two, again, we have these vast fiber bundles. So this first diagram shows us an unredded hemp stem. So fresh harvested off the field. And we see all these fiber bundles are held very tightly together. The next panel shows an, an additional time step into the redding where we start to see a, some spaces beginning to emerge. And then the next two panels show an even further redding process on these stems. So at the final stage here, we see there's a lot of separation that's starting to happen between these vast fiber bundles and also the inner woody core as well as the epidermal tissue on the plant. So that's really important. That is um, the microbial or field redding process, but we also see water and tank redding being used in some circumstances. So water redding in open waterways like this is not a um, very sustainable practice because of the action of the bacteria and the compounds that are leaching from the stems. So we often see redding occurring in these controlled tank environments where we can apply different microbes or different compounds to help to, to facilitate that redding action. But it's still not a process that's very widely used in Europe or in the US where the much more common process we see is field redding or dew redding, where right after that uh, fiber is harvested, it's laid down in the field and the natural microbes that occur in the environment as well as on the stem of the plant act to break down the pectin within the stem. So there's a lot to be learned about what the optimal conditions are for redding across different climates throughout the world. And that's something I hope we have more data on soon.
So once that fiber material is redded and we're ready to have a separation from, of the bass fiber bundles from the herd, the next step is a mechanical or physical separation of those bass fibers from the herd through a process called decortication. Decortication is usually achieved by these machines with rollers. So hopefully you can see the video here. This is an example of a small scale fiber processing machine where you can see their hand feeding. I would not recommend that anybody put their fingers that close to a machine, but you can see what is happening here. These uh, rollers are crushing the plant stem and the inner woody core drops out from the bottom here and those longer bast fibers come out and collect at the backside of the machine. So we can see them putting these intact hemp stems or hemp straw into the machine and these rollers are crushing the stems while the herd or shives falls out the bottom. And again, those long bass fibers are coming out the back of the machine. After that material passes through the decortication step, there's two other steps involved. And these are steps that have been adopted from flax processing. So flax is a similar crop that's grown to produce linen. And these two steps are called scutching and hackling. So scutching is a step that removes all those small pieces of herd or shies, as well as some of the toe or the short fibers from the longer bast fiber bundles. And then hackling is the next step. That's a combing process that's used to soften and align the fibers. So the video that I'm gonna show next is one of these small scale processing lines that's been developed for flax, but is also easily adapted for hemp fiber processing. So this is the scutching machine. So again, that's the machine that's gonna take any of those residual inner woody herd pieces and remove them. So they'll all be essentially scraped off of the stems. And we also see in this process, a lot of the shorter fibers, the toe flying off of that line. So now we're ready for the hackling step. And this is essentially, again, this combing and aligning machine. So here's what one of these small scale machines looks like. That's the fiber that comes out at the end of the process. And we'll see it running here. So it's a series of combs that have increasingly tighter spacing of their teeth as we move across the processing line. So once we've finished with our scutching and hackling, we have long spinnable hemp fibers. And across these different steps, we've also separated out some other important products like the herd or shives, as well as the toe. So short, non-aligned fibers that have many other applications. And there's a huge range of different products that hemp fiber and hemp herds can be incorporated into. I've highlighted just a small set of those here, but composites, for example, are ones that are produced mostly using those um, herd or shive products. Animal bedding is a huge use right now within the US for herd products. Those non-aligned short fibers called toe can be incorporated into products like paper. And those longer aligned hemp fibers can be incorporated into products like ropes or for example, textiles or other technical products even including batteries. So that's fiber. Let's spend some time thinking about hemp grain processing which has fewer technical sounding terms, but somewhat of a complicated process diagram here. So after we've harvested our grain with a combine and we've cleaned it to remove any of those residual bracts or plant material that could potentially cause spoilage in our grain bins, we've assumed it's all dried down, the processor receives that hemp grain and then has a lot of choices about what to do with it. So one option, if you wanted to produce a product like hemp hearts, would be to take 
those whole hemp seeds and remove the outer hull portion so that we have those yummy hemp hearts we would put on our yogurt. And that gives us two products, hemp holes, which are high in fiber, as well as the high protein hemp hearts. We might also choose to press for oil, and usually that's done from whole hemp seeds, but it can also be done from the hulled hemp hearts. And that gives us, again, two products, one that's called press cake or seed meat, and another that is unrefined oil that might go on to you know, specialty dressings or could be further refined into other products. So let's look at the steps along the way. The first is the dehulling step. If we wanted to produce hemp hearts, the most common way that we remove those hulls from the heart is using an impact dehuller, where the whole hemp grains are introduced through the top of this machine here in the center. And then these paddles are spinning around at very high speeds and they accelerate the individual hemp grains into the side of the equipment here. And essentially that impact of the seed breaking into the, um, the side breaks the hull and releases the heart. There are several other options that are available to dehull hemp seeds, including bar dehullers and roller dehullers. However, hemp does not necessarily always have very uniform size, particularly because it's continuing to mature grain across the season. So you can use some sorting procedures ahead of time to sort out those very small or perhaps even unusually large grains, but impact dehulling is a great option for hemp seed processing because it can accommodate some of that variability in seed size. Any of these processes though are gonna give you a mix then of holes together with your hearts, which nobody wants to put on their yogurt in the morning. So it's really important to have a separation step that comes next. And there's a few options here for how you might approach that. One is to use these table separators. So these rely on shaking of angled table, tables to separate out a mix of materials based on differences in their weight. So lighter materials will come off one end of the table and heavier materials will come off another. And by linking these together in a chain or a series, you actually can make several different separations in one pass. Another option that's great for small scale is pneumatic separation or essentially using air and gravity together to make that separation based on the size and the surface area of a mixed set of objects. So here these brown points would represent the heavier hearts and blue points would represent the lighter hulls coming off of your dehulling line and entering into your separator. And those heavy hearts and holes drop down from your hopper and are introduced into this chamber where there's a strong flow of air coming through the machine. That air will blow the lighter material with a larger surface area off into a second chamber where the heavier material will collect in a different one. So there we are achieving that separation. So I mentioned earlier that you might wanna take those parts um, and press them. But again, frequently growers and processors are choosing to put whole hemp seeds into the next step for um, oil expelling in this case. So having those holes on can help to increase the friction and the amount of oil that you are able to press out. And most processors are using screw presses um, at cold conditions, which isn't necessarily cold, but they're, it's, it's sort of warm. It's below the threshold for a cold pressed seed oil. And so we start out with introducing seeds into the hopper and then inside of the barrel of a screw press, we have our expeller screw. So this has increasingly tight spacing and it's rotating across the barrel's length. At the end of the barrel, there's these pores that allow the oil that is pressed out under pressure to be released from the channel 
And then all of the rest of that product is uh, extruded through the nozzle at the end of the machine. And I'm going to show you a video of what that process looks like at small scale. So this is a hemp seed oil press from a German company. Here you can see those pores in the barrel where the oil is able to come out. They have a temperature probe here monitoring the temperature of that oil to ensure that it is within cold press standards because the pressure generated within that barrel and the friction can actually raise the temperature overall. We can change the speed of these machines depending on the attributes of those hemp grain feedstocks that are going in or to try to control the temperature of the machine. And then here at the end, you see the press cake that's coming out. So that is rich in all of those holes and also protein that was not extruded in the oil portion. So again, that's the overview of hemp grain processing going from cleaned and dried whole hemp grains through dehulling and then also through oil pressing, where we end up with that seed cake or seed meal, which can be very high in fiber as well as protein, to unrefined oil or even refined oils. And these are used in a wide range of different products. So I'm seeing a lot of beauty and personal care products and stores within the US that are starting to incorporate hemp seed oils for its beneficial properties, as well as hemp seed oil supplements. And it's really important to distinguish that kind of product from what other products that may be labeled as hemp oil extracts that are actually more for the cannabinoid composition of that product, whereas a hemp seed oil should not have cannabinoids present in it. We also see a big, you know, wide range of different food products, the specialty hemp seed oils, hemp hearts I mentioned earlier, as well as that hemp protein, which is derived from the press cake when it's ground up and separated out through some sifting steps. There's a, a number of new and innovative products I'm excited about. So it was really cool to see folks that are including um, hemp grain as part of the mash in their distilled products like this one here. And of course, hemp for many, many years has been included as both a pet bird food and a wild bird food ingredient. But we are starting to see a lot more research and hopefully we'll soon see the adoption of hemp grain as livestock and poultry feeds within the US. So on to our last step of, of the flour processing. So here there's a few different options, but the very first and most important thing after harvest is to make sure that you are stabilizing your product. And that can be achieved in a number of ways. One option is by drying that flour right away while it's still on the stem. Another option that I see a lot of producers use, using is freezing their product. That flour material, um, when it's removed from the stem through this process called bucking, which you can do either after that material is dry or even when it's fresh and wet, can then be trimmed for smokable hemp flour products, or it may go through some milling processes to reduce the size of the flour so that it can be incorporated into other products like pre-rolls or to increase the efficiency of extraction processes. So let's take a look at what drying looks like in practice. There's a lot of growers um, who choose to dry their hemp biomass or their hemp flower material in protected sort of temporary areas like these coop houses here. So in one case, we have um, a barrier on the ground, which is great for helping to mitigate any humidity that may be coming up or vapors that are coming up from the ground. In this case, we have a grower who's hanging hemp in a hoop house that has open ends and also an open floor, which means that they might you know, need to be thinking very carefully about outdoor weather conditions and managing the humidity in that environment. Because what we do not wanna see is any of those post-harvest microbes 
that can destroy crops and can also cause potentially some unhealthy conditions in the products that are produced from them. So many growers, especially for high value crops, have come to develop these much more controlled conditions indoor where we can monitor airflow, we can monitor humidity and temperature very carefully within the crop. One thing you'll also notice here in this example is that the plants have been broken down to individual branches so that there's a lot more uniformity in the drying area compared to the last slide I showed where the interior of the plant here may have a much higher level of humidity and again therefore potentially susceptible to microbial growth within that region. So here they've, in, they've broken the plant down into individual branches and they've also removed a lot of those big broad fan leaves from the plants to help to facilitate that drying process. Growers that are um, and processors that are doing really large scale processing might also choose to use some of these faster, higher heat technology. So in this case, this is an example of a forage dryer that's being used to quickly dry down a large volume of already milled hemp flour here. So these processes are very fast. They can dry out your plant very fast, but they also may come at the cost of losing some of those valuable compounds like terpenes that are quite valuable. In response to that, growers have started to explore other technologies like freeze dryers. There's some very large scale freeze dryer products that are on the market now that operate under a vacuum, but at very, very low temperatures in order to sublimate the water off of the flower. And they give you a very well preserved, very good color flower product coming out of these. So in terms of removing those flowers from the stem, this is an example of uh, what a bucking room might look like where we're removing those inflorescences from the stem that they have been dried on. This is an incredibly labor intensive process and so can cost a large amount of money if you need to employ a staff to process large volumes of hemp flower. And in response to that, the industry has been introducing several innovative products. One that I will show you here is one of these automated bucking machines. So here you can see they're introducing the stem and it's automatically stripping off all of the flower material from the stem using these two rollers here to make that separation. So these machines can be used on dry or on uh, fresh or wet hemp material. So this is just a snapshot of what that looked like for this particular product from Munch Machines called the Mother Bucker. It has two rollers that grab onto the stem, but then a hole that makes it so only the stem can go through and none of the flower material, which is left behind. So for those processors that want to um, produce a product for pre-rolls or for extract, one of the next steps in the process before we dive into the extraction itself is size reduction. So they might choose to use a machine like the knife mill that's pictured here that chops up that flour to a very particular size so that we can optimize the efficiency of our extracts. And so again, just to leave you with a picture of what this overall process looks like before we continue on and dive in on this extract portion of the talk. So in extracts for high cannabinoid products, there's a range of different options and technologies that are available. They broadly fall into two classes, those that are based on solvents and those that are solvent free and based on mechanical separation. So beginning with those solvent based processes, I'll give you a process diagram for each one of these and then briefly touch on the pros and cons for each of them. So we'll start out with the, the highest throughput example, which is an ethanol based solvent extraction. So these can be operated at relatively high volumes 
And ethanol is a compound that is generally considered as a safe product to keep around, which allows us to use it at high capacity. This is the same ethanol, but a very high proof as what we might find in alcoholic beverages. So we have a large ethanol storage tank area. For optimal extraction conditions, these pieces of equipment and systems are operated at extremely cold temperatures. And the reason for that is that room temperature, ethanol has very low specificity as a solvent, which means it's not only going to extract the cannabinoids and terpenes and other compounds you might want, but it's also going to co-extract many other compounds like chlorophyll, which gives the plants their green color, or some of the waxes that are structural in those plants that would need to be cleaned up in post-processing. So some of that process can be optimized by keeping your ethanol extraction temperatures extremely cold. So those cooled ethanol um, storage areas will come into, again, a chilled extraction vessel. I'm also seeing a lot of centrifuge type systems that spin the ethanol, kind of like a washing machine would spin it in order to get all of that ethanol removed from the flour material that's in here when we're finished with our process. And then these come into a collection station. And importantly, the solvent, the ethanol in this case, needs to be removed from the product. So here's one example of a post-processing piece of equipment called a rotary evaporator or rotovap, which uses the difference in the boiling point of ethanol versus the boiling points of the compounds of interest, like cannabinoids, for example, which so cannabinoids have a much lower or sorry, much higher boiling point than ethanol does. So you can set a, a hot water bath and submerge this globe with your extract into it. And you can set that at a temperature that is higher than the boiling point of your ethanol, but lower than the boiling point of your cannabinoids so that the ethanol boils off and is collected you can also do this under vacuum to reduce those boiling points and use less energy. That's re the ethanol is recollected and reintroduced into the system, leaving you with your more concentrated hemp extract at the end. So hydrocarbons are one that are increasing in popularity. A pro to these systems is that they have much higher specificity compared to ethanol. They're also very fast in their extraction. A con to these systems, though, is that they are, of course, prone potentially to explosion when systems are not well engineered. So, of course, butane is a really common example of a hydrocarbon that's used in these systems. And there are strict regulatory limits about how much butane processing facilities can keep on hand. And so that sets an upper limit on the overall capacity of hydrocarbon extractors. But for craft extractors, they are a really great solution because of that high specificity. So usually we will keep a reservoir under pressure of our solvent like uh, butane, for example, that will move in the liquid phase because it's under pressure into our extraction column where our hemp flower material is. It comes out of this column and then through a series of reduced pressure steps, we can first drop out some of the waxes that may have been co-extracted, and then finally collect out those cannabinoid and terpene molecules, and then resend that uh, solvent back into the system. So this is a closed loop system, which many jurisdictions are now requiring processors who use these technologies to use. One that is very popular and generally considered um, safe as well is a supercritical fluid extractor. So here we're not using any explosive or flammable solvents. We're simply using CO2 under high pressure. The safety precaution here though, is that this is under extremely high pressures. So these systems need to be very well engineered. And in this case, we take CO2, which is normally a gas, 
and we exert a lot of pressure and also cold temperatures to bring that CO2 to its super critical point. So this point where it's got properties of both a liquid and a gas, and by very precisely controlling the parameters, so the density of that supercritical fluid, we can make very high specificity extracts using supercritical CO2 extractors. The other benefit of these systems is because they're using CO2 as their solvent, that goes back into the atmosphere and we don't need to worry about potential contamination of residual solvents in the system. The con to these systems, in addition to operating at very high pressures, is that they're sort of slow and their overall capacity is somewhat low for that reason. So here we take that um, highly pressurized, super critical CO2 and we introduce it into our extraction vessel here. And it spends several hours interacting with the hemp flower that's in that column and then moves into these separate separation states that has the graduated decrease in pressure in the system until you're left finally with your last fraction, including things like cannabinoids, and that CO2 can then be cycled back and reintroduced into the system. One of the lowest tech solvent-based options is a classic oil infusion. And there's several platforms or technologies that have thought about bringing this up to a much more industrial scale. But simply put, these um, use an oil. So something like olive oil, for example, you could also use MCT oil or even hemp seed oil in order to extract those lipophilic cannabinoid compounds, that means they like fats and they'll move into the oil with the addition of heat as a source. So this is sort of a very low tech option, but potentially depending on how high this temperature gets, you might not necessarily meet the safety requirements to kill any microbes that could be contaminating your extract. So I know we're running out low on time here, so I want to move through these other solvent-free options that use mechanical force to separate trichomes from the plant material. One of them that's also relatively low-tech is a rosin press. So these take um, hemp flour or um, the ice water hash products or other trichomes that have been separated and press them at high pressure and with heat between two metal plates. And the cannabinoids and terpenes will flow off of these plates. So you could start out with this um, hemp flower that's gone through an ice water extraction. So products that come out of this are generally referred to as ice water hash or bubble hash. Here's an example of a large scale option for this mechanical separation, but hemp flour that's frozen is introduced into this ice water bath so that it is maintained at a cold temperature and then agitated either by hand with paddles or through some mechanical process. And then there's a set of filters that will separate out the plant material from those small little trichome heads, which you would be left with at the end. So finally, independent of whatever extraction method you may have applied upstream, there's several additional refinement steps that you could apply. Starting with crude oil, which is in this you know, highest unrefined class that's closest to what was represented in the plant that it was extracted from. This contains a full spectrum of different compounds that we want but it may also contain a lot of compounds that were co-extracted that we do not want, like the chlorophylls and waxes I mentioned earlier. You could further refine that product using filters, for example, charcoal filters are a great, a great option, as well as a process called winterization, which subjects your extract to some very cold temperatures that precipitate out the waxes from the solution. And you may also at this stage choose to go through some decarboxylation steps 
that take the cannabinoids from the acidic form that they're found primarily in, in the plant into their neutral forms. You could further refine your product into a distillate using either a short path distillation, which operates on, on principles that are very similar to the rotovap I showed you earlier, or through a white film or falling film distillation apparatus. And then finally, we get our most refined product. So these contain a narrow spectrum or even a single cannabinoid or terpene compound at very, very high purity. And these are isolated through chromatography practices and then through crystallization of those products. So I think I've taken up a bunch of time talking and I really wanna make sure that we have time to get to our questions for today. So I will leave it here at that slide and um, feel free, I guess, Tony or George to go ahead and start shooting questions from the audience at me. Yeah, awesome. Great, great talk, Heather. Um, so we have lots of questions in the chat. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, Taj Star asks, uh, do you have any experience with using the hemp train as a processor? Are there any caveats? Thank you. So the hemp train, for those who are not in the fiber world, is one of those um, decortication platforms, but also offers a lot of the separation of those um, smaller fragments like the toe as well as the herd and even separating your herd into different grades. So tiny dust herd versus larger herd that might be suitable for hempcrete, for example. I do not personally have any experience working with a hemp train, but there are um, several in operation, one of which I think is in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, not too far from us here. So. I'm excited to, to potentially get the chance to see that in action. Great. Um, another question uh, from Don. Um, are the hemp grant separators available? If so, uh, what would be the nominal costs? There are, so separators in terms of like the impact dehullers or table separators, the brand that we use is Fosberg in our, at our Agritech campus in Geneva, New York, uh, where Tony, Zach and George are located. We have a full grain processing line from Fosberg there. I do not know off the top of my head exactly the numbers, but the nice thing also is that these are fairly customizable lines where each piece of equipment can be purchased separately and built up. And I know there are even folks in the industry who are using those same pieces of equipment you would use for grain processing to do some sorting of material that comes out of fiber decortication as well. Great. Uh, another question from Mary Yerlina. Uh, asks grain processing questions. Is the equipment fairly standard if you are already a grain farmer slash grain processor, or is there special equipment required for him? That's an excellent question. And I think it speaks to a broader trend within the industry. So the same equipment that you would use to process other oil seeds can be fairly easily adapted to process hemp grain, which is why we've seen much less of a bottleneck in ramping up hemp grain production compared to hemp fiber production, where sure, we can sort of adapt some of the flax processing equipment, but there's not much of that in the US to begin with. And there's still a whole suite of other optimization steps that we need for fiber processing. So I would say those who are using a, a screw press to process other oil seed crops would very easily be able to do a little bit of process optimization and to produce some really nice quality hemp seed oil. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Sarah Eichler asks, is there more than pectinases at work uh, with fiber redding? Do synthetic pectinases facilitate controlled redding? That is an excellent question. There are surely many other compounds in addition to pectinases. So pectinases are enzymes that break down pectin. There are other compounds that might 
contribute to the breakdown of lignin as well. And there's a lot of active research going on right now in microbes that may produce some of these interesting compounds that facilitate redding, as well as enzymes that we could just add to controlled redding environments to optimize the quality of the fiber material that's being produced. Fantastic. Um, question from Gary Fish asks, how safe is ethanol in regards to flammability and worker exposure? Is an ethanol a known carcinogen? So ethanol is um, certainly flammable, but unlike hydrocarbons, it's not explosive or extremely volatile. So that does increase the safety. There, I'm sure there have been studies that have linked ethanol to carcinogenic activity, particularly through pro prolonged exposure over time. So it is really important when you are working with an equipment supplier to make sure that they have the appropriate process controls in place to safely handle something like ethanol. So it's considered safe in terms of like the threshold for allowing those residual solvents into products is relatively high. We consume ethanol in beverages, it's added to pharmaceutical products and it's, you know, can be found in many other things. So it's safer than hydrocarbons, but there are of course, long-term exposure considerations and, and flammability that do need to be taken into account. Uh, great. Uh, another question from Joy uh, asks, besides chlorophyll and fats and waxes, what else is extracted at room temperature or up to 60 degrees C uh, ethanol, ethanol extraction? That is an excellent question. Um, there are also many other compounds of interest in hemp, including some flavonoids that could also be extracted using ethanol. Um, it's possible also that you might co-extract some sugars as well from the plant during that ethanol extraction, which is again why we would want to reduce the temperature of our ethanol extractions if what we want to target is the cannabinoids. Um, a question from Don asks, uh, do all hemp grain food products have uh, GRAS, uh, generally recognized as safe status from FDA, and livestock feed status from USDA. So um, for human consumption, there's a lot more that is permitted. Of course, there's always safety considerations in terms of mycotoxins and microbes that may be contaminating hemp grain products, but we've allowed hemp grain products um, like the ones I showed you earlier, including the pressed hemp seed oils, and cake, which can be processed into protein powders, and the hemp hearts for human consumption. Those are all considered as appropriate food ingredients and generally recognized as safe. The same is not true for livestock. So there's a, a separate body that regulates the ingredients that can go into livestock and poultry and make sure that they're safe for the animals as well as safe for the consumers that are going to be purchasing those products. And you know, I know those agencies are actively engaged with the hemp industry right now and working through the process of the research that needs to be conducted to make sure that we are ensuring the safety of those products. So I'm hoping very soon we will have um, hemp grain and hemp press cake available to feed to livestock because I think that's a really important development overall in the hemp grain market to be able to have access to that you know, on the off chance that you're not able to send your material to a human food processor, that you could divert that and have the secondary market available to you or a secondary market for the byproducts like the press cake that's, in, that's um, co-produced in hemp oil production. Awesome. Um, there's been a few questions about your very first infographic that you showed about uh, New York and uh, 
basically asking the ratio, uh, how was the layout of processors and growers? Is it mainly cannabinoids, fiber, grain? What is the uh, outlook on that? So in New York State, um, very early on in the adoption of hemp by um, ag and markets through our um, hemp research licensing program, we did have a lot of production of fiber and grain across the state. But subsequently, as licenses became available to more folks within the industry, we saw high cannabinoid hemp really take over a lot of the acres within the state. So within the Northeast, that's our predominant um, crop that we grow. So I'm hoping that we will see the introduction of more grain and fiber within the state as our processing capacity is able to spool up as well. Awesome, fantastic, uh, Heather. But I think that's all the time we have for questions. So I just wanted to thank Dr. Grab once again. I feel like she got uh, several months of lectures crammed into an hour and answered questions. We had so many today um, and we're, we're so grateful for her. Also wanna thank um, Pam and Chris for translation or interpreting today. That's much appreciated. And I really wanna give a shout out to our friends and collaborators at the 1890 institutions. So thank y'all all so much and we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks to everyone. If there are any questions that we didn't have time to address, please feel free to get in touch with me at my email or LinkedIn or other forums. It was such a pleasure to be here to talk with you today. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.